I'm sorry for punching you all the time. I hope you forgive me. I don't really know. I feel like second year medicine was a bit of a blur. It's a very medicine-y interview. What is the reason why I'm here today? But Jesus is okay. great. And then I started accidentally eating whilst he was praying. Important to read the Bible. I mean, Jesus describes it as... But basically, it's our living, <laughs> our daily bread. When I was in year seven, for example, I'd always get into arguments with my friends about God, and I just really didn't know Eva's lyrics. Tomorrow. Like, we think there's always tomorrow. But actually, there might not always be tomorrow. Even after becoming a Christian, you still sin every day. Um, I deleted my first videos. They were even more embarrassing than my videos at the moment. So I'm not going to keep them public. <laughs> uh, it's quite funny that that's my most watched video. It's a bit weird. Basically, but it's kind of embarrassing. Like, I'm never prepared at some of the hard questions that people ask me. Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, yeah. I was actually summoned by like a mysterious owl. Yes, and I kept crying and like slam my books down. And, like, <laughs> Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to my podcast, Coffee's on Me, David Kwan, where I strive to give guests legacy-worthy interviews that listeners can enjoy while cooking, commuting, relaxing, or walking their pets. We are on the Friday of the May week celebrations, and exams are finished today, um, which is a lovely time at Cambridge where people just get to enjoy the sunshine, and there has been lots and lots of um, picnics and spraying and a party, which has been um, really nice. It's nice to be here without exams and just sharing um, quality time with friends. Um, although for me um, and many others, hay fever is um, definitely affecting us, as you might be able to tell through this recording, which I do apologise. Um, nevertheless, I'm very grateful to be here with my guest today. What did you have? What did I have? Oh, oh, I had a Fitzbillies salted caramel and chocolate bun. Hope that was tasty. It was lovely, thank you. <laughs> I feel very blessed that we are now approaching the ne next podcast milestone, which is 100,000 podcast downloads. Please know that I don't take any of your time, feedback and support for granted, because when I started this Passion Project podcast at a low point of my time in Cambridge, I was genuinely motivated by three founding ideals. Number one, purpose of giving. Number two, learning from others. And number three, sharing of stories. These three aspirations still make up the content description for every single episode. Indeed, the opportunities to strive to give my courageous and insightful guests legacy-worthy interviews over coffee, tea, bubble tea, water, juice, cake, or whatever it is, despite my many inadequacies, have been a tremendous privilege that imbues me with gratitude. I know that I will look back and listen back to laugh at how naive I am. But if you have been enjoying the discussions on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts, thank you. And please do consider leaving a review and nominating a guest by contacting me via my link tree, David Kwan. Seeing this podcast on people's Spotify raps or receiving positive messages about the guests give me tremendous fulfillment. I cannot thank my wonderful guests enough for their courage and insights. I genuinely maintain the deep conviction that this passion project, if wholly true to those founding motivations about giving, learning and sharing, is a worthwhile pursuit. So now on to my very creative, talented and um, awesome guest. Rosia Lee was born in Colchester and has lived in Buckinghamshire since she was four, going to boarding school in year nine. Aside from doing her degree, Rosia enjoys getting involved in badminton, music, church, Christian union and especially spending time with friends. Rosia has a YouTube channel with 7,000 plus subscribers, which she uses for blogging. This is a platform through which she helps others demystify university life, including but not limited to medicine, faith, and lifestyle. Rosia, um, welcome to my podcast, Coffees on Me, David Kwan. Hello, thank you for having me. How was your day? It was great. I went to a kick you, which is Cambridge Christian Union, event about um, does Jesus truly satisfy I had a prayer meeting in the morning as well with my college Christian Union group and I was just chilling in a bookshop until 4.30 So you just finished second year medicine which many would say is the hardest year of your degree if not life, uh, how does it feel to be at Cambridge with friends and not have that academic pressure and workload Hmm yeah, it feels, like, relatively normal, actually. Like, I don't know. I don't really know. I feel like second-year medicine was a bit of a blur. It was definitely not easy, but also... Um, 
I mean, even though people say it's like the hardest year, I keep on reading things which are like fourth years are also stressing out. And I feel like it's always, it's a lifelong thing. So um, I'm really grateful for the ways that work has taught me how to, you know, appreciate time spent not working better. But also I'm just so grateful for time after exams. It's just been great. Are you still doing your Enki? Um, unfortunately not. I'm, yeah, I'm kind of missing it, getting withdrawal symptoms, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, medicine is obviously one of the really, like, popular, I guess, courses, at least in Australia, where mm. most people aim for medicine. Well, the joke at most private schools for example is that you aim for medicine mm. if you don't get the score so you fail the interview or you don't get great UCAT grades then you do law then you do engineering otherwise you're a disappointment to your parents um, you're, you're a peak of that hierarchy mm. um, so I was wondering um, when did you kind of decide that you wanted to study medicine and what were the factors that contributed to it oh that's a very medicine-y interview, interview <laughs> questions all those flashbacks um, I don't, I don't really know. I think so ever since I was a kid, I just really wanted to do, like, being a doctor was always on my radar. And when I was in year 11, one of my family friends came to Trinity to do medicine and we helped her move in. And that just really inspired me to, basically, I just think you can't really go wrong with a job where you can help other people. Sounds really cliche, but a meaningful job where it's working with people rather than kind of like for the money or in an office. Mm-hmm. And um, did you feel like there was a, that moment was when you kind of buckled down and went, okay, what do I actually need to do to get into medicine? And you start devising a plan or were you just still going along school and just seeing where life takes you? Um, I definitely had a plan. Like I definitely knew um, what I wanted to, what I needed to do to achieve, uh, to work towards this goal but also I think like I guess the same for any pursuit in life it's important to like hold it loosely because ultimately like I believe that God is in control of wherever he wants me to be he'll place me there so even if I work really hard if he doesn't want me somewhere then I won't be there so I guess it's doing it all like working hard but not putting your worth in something like a degree like medicine um I think yeah I I wouldn't really see it as the top of the hierarchy I mean coming from an Asian household also I get what you mean by the fact that it's in like it's in some of some people's cultures to really revere some professions but I think like I think it's obviously I'm biased and I think it's such a special job but also like I think God has given us all different things that are more suited us suited to each other. Like I could never do something like engineering, for example. <laughs> and engineers do an amazing job. So mm. yeah. So you've been quite involved in the Christian Union, um, here at university. Um, what does that involve? Well, the Christian Union is just great. We're, there's an executive committee of eight people and there's also staff workers. So Basically, most universities across country have a Christian union and they exist to make Jesus known to every student at university. Um, so we have amazing staff workers who work for the charity UCCF and they oversee kind of the running of Christian unions and they help out the executive committee when they need to. And it's essentially training us to on how to live for Jesus at university, how to speak to friends about him, um, which I think is the most important thing for people to know. And it's also putting on events to show people the gospel in a really friendly and informal way. And um, what do you know of Jesus? What do I know? (laughs) I don't know very much, but all I know is that Jesus is... Jesus is the reason why I'm here today because 
he's God, and God is the reason why I'm here today. But <laughs> Jesus is great. He basically came down to earth um, so that he could live a perfect, blameless life um, and step into our shoes and die for us because he, of his great love for us and then rose again and he defeated death and that means we're blameless before God and that's just great because it means I'm free and so even during times where work is hard or second year medicine like I know I'll always be free <laughs> that's wonderful and were you always, um, or did you grow up in a Christian household? And yeah, where, how, where did your faith journey begin? My parents became Christians when they moved to the UK. So they were they were originally from China, and my dad came to the UK to do a PhD, and my mum also came. And I think after a few years of working, they kind of realised life is just a bit meaningless when you've got kind of the daily grind when you don't have a purpose to live for and so my mum was like you know what I was just invited to a bible study so I'll go to the bible study at first she thought it was a bit weird but then after a <laughs> while she realized like Jesus is the only thing that can truly satisfy that all of our longings no matter how much we try to meet them in things like academic success or whatever people strive for nowadays um, the only thing that can truly give meaning and purpose to life is Jesus and then still so they became Christians and then they had me and my brother so we were born in a Christian family anyway that wasn't really me that was my parents sorry um, but <laughs> then me I was baptized when I was 14 and I've just yeah I'm really lucky I'm really grateful to my parents for bringing me up like praying with me when I was younger taking me to church and youth group every week yeah so do they share uh, the fact that you I guess started that answering that question by sharing their faith journey does that mm. mean that how they came to faith especially um, you know moving places and moving home did that really just um, was that a topic of discussion at home, I guess, how they came to faith and their journey and what it all means from their perspective? Um, not really frequently. I think, yeah, I mean, yeah, not really. <laughs> okay. Um, so in your household then, I'm guessing you would pray before food and what, what is mm. the, if, what does living like a Christian mean on a day-to-day -day level? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, at home, we try to pray before food. Obviously, like, sometimes I forget, and once um, <laughs> someone was praying, and then I started accidentally eating whilst he was praying. But, you know, that's okay. <laughs> um, and what was I going to say? What was the question? Like, li what does living like a Christian look like? In the Lee household. In the Lee household. I guess I feel like I'm quite far apart from my home now because I barely spend any m prolonged time with them. So, But the wonderful thing about being a Christian is that you have family everywhere you go because church um, is your family and all Christians um, are brothers and sisters in Christ um, and that's so wonderful. But yeah, at home... My parents, my dad would pray bef with me before I slept when I was a kid every night. And then, yeah, my parents would point me to the Bible. And, yeah. And going to our youth groups, as you mentioned, every week, mm -hmm. um, was that something you willingly wanted to do each week? Or did you also have moments before you were baptised in 14, like, why am I doing this? Like, I could be, I don't know, out there on a Sunday play sport or badminton or whatever it is um not really i really enjoyed youth group and socializing and <laughs> yeah i think i think what was really pivotal in my faith journey was going to camps and being with so many people who were so on fire for god 
and who showed to me what it was like to live as a Christian and not just preach it but actually live in a way that emulates Jesus and that was really powerful um, what uh, obviously Jesus has done so much you know the, the example showing the gospel you know mm -hmm. from healing like I can see that medicine connection and all that but is there any particular um, actions or values by, by, by Jesus that you really just hold particularly dearly in your own personal life? Mm, that's a really good question. I think... I just think it's wonderful. I guess one thing. Oh, there's so many wonderful things about Jesus. But one thing that I've thought about, I guess, recently is the fact that Jesus prays for us. Um, he cares about us so much that he willingly had so much love and compassion that he died for us, for our sins. And yet he, yet he still also prays for us and he wants to see us grow and to be, you know, to love him more as well. And that's so wonderful. And what's your routine with Bible studies? Like, do you read it every morning or do you mm. pray on it and just paint the picture of living as a Christian, like keeping yeah. on that theme? I think it's so important to read the Bible. It's, I mean, Jesus describes it as, I think he describes it, I don't really know, but basically <laughs> it's our living, it's like our daily bread, right? So we need to be fed on the Bible, but I'm not perfect. And sometimes I like, don't read the Bible, which is basically, I've only really started reading the Bible really regularly since about December, maybe November or December last year, even though I've been a Christian for many years. Um, I think I've missed out on a lot of Bible reading and I just really want to read more. And I've never read the full Bible before, but I'm, I started from Genesis at the start of this year and I'm going through the Old Testament um, and I try to read in the morning. Today, for example, I read in the afternoon. But, yeah, I think I pray when I read the Bible. And there's just unsearchable things, like unending things that you can learn in the Bible about God. And it's so central to our faith because it's how God speaks to us and um, any particular Bible verses that you have felt yourself lean on in tough times or difficult times or when you seek guidance mm. yeah I think well, some things that come straight to mind when I need I guess inspiration for prayer or comfort other Psalms so there's so many different psalms to show every single, the breadth of human experience and emotion, right? And if you need comfort, I guess the classic one to go to is Psalm 23, which is, the Lord is my shepherd. Um, and yeah, I guess verses which just <laughs> show me that God's promises hold true and that he's never changing and um, that we're kept safe because of his because of what he did for us any verses which basically proclaim the gospel such as Romans chapter 8 it's just a summary of the gospel and that's so great so I guess being on these youth camps, um, obviously yeah. everyone is pretty on the same page. They've been to youth groups, they understand or at least the core messages of the gospel. When you interact with people who are not a part of the Christian Union, how have those um, discussions gone either at uni or throughout childhood? And perhaps what are some of the misconceptions that people have or what would you like people to know? Very broad questions. That is a very broad question. Wow. Um, <laughs> Intentionally so. <laughs> I think I've always enjoyed speaking about Jesus to other people because once you know of something good, you just you just want to share it, you know. You want other people to have what you have. And 
I've always loved bringing... I mean, I've never really done it in the best way. I mean, I'm, as in, I don't always do it in the best way because, like, when I was in year seven, for example, I'd always get into arguments with my friends about God and I just really didn't know what I'm talking about. I still don't really know what I'm talking about. But I think the main goal is to show people who Jesus is, make, help them to open the Bible, read it, and get them to make... I mean, it's always a personal decision, faith is, and it's up to them to be able to decide whether they want to trust in Jesus, whether they believe he is who he says he is. And I guess part of the amazing thing about being Christian is that you can help, like you can be part of other people's journey and come into faith because God works through you and that is such a privilege um but yeah I think one of the best things is opening the bible with someone who isn't a Christian because it's just showing them the best thing so if one of your non-Christian friends you know tells you like oh I'm really interested but I'm feeling overwhelmed by the the bible there's so much I don't know where to start um and I'm really busy with exams I've got you know uh work or whatever it is um what would you recommend them I think we like to think in Cambridge that we're forever going to stay this way I think the bubble doesn't really help and like Justin Bieber's lyrics um uh, it's something like young something thinks there's no always tomorrow like we think there's always tomorrow um but actually like there might not always be tomorrow we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow we can't boast in tomorrow um we only have like this present moment and even then I think it's just the best use of your time to be able to think about what actually is important in life like why are you here um you know like death is a reality that we will all have to come face one day um well unless Jesus comes but anyway um (laughs) I think it's I think if I was speaking to a non-Christian friend who I dearly loved and deeply cared about, I would tell them that, you know, this is urgent. You've, you've, you've got you've to go, you know. You've got to read the Bible. You've got to see whether this is true. And you don't have all the time in the world because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, although, like, do your work. Like, do what, <laughs> what God put you here to do. And I think the balance between, like, doing your work, getting involved and, like, extracurriculars and reading the bible is always hard and I don't get it right at all and I always find myself and idolizing work or other things and yeah but then I realize whenever you start the day by reading the bible it's always better and having a slow like some of the calmest people I know around exam season like for example just uh I don't know my boyfriend Daniel he reads the bible so much and he's like a natural scientist and he has so much work but he's like one of the calmest people I knew during exam season even though he still like prioritized spending time with God every day and I just yeah I just see it in so many people around me and that really inspires me I can attest that Rosie and Daniel are always smiling in the library. It's a rare sight. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see. <laughs> Rejoicing. Uh, <laughs> so, so what kind of questions have you got from your friends about your faith? Wait, sorry, say that again. So what have your non-Christian friends mm. uh, asked you that? perhaps recurring always comes up or have really shocked you, surprised you, impressed you? Um, oh, that always come up. I feel like everyone's a bit different. Like, everyone has different things. I guess some things 
I guess some things always shock me. Like, I'm never prepared at some of the hard questions that people ask me. And I try to prepare, but then I forget my answers again. So it's just like, I don't know. It's a bit of a struggle, but, you know, I'm always learning. Some things that are unexpected are particularly um, topics related to cultural, culturally relevant issues. Um especially during, like, you can, you can think about what they are, right, yep. during this day, and how the Bible can, <laughs> says about them, and then how do you reconcile that, um, knowing the culture of today. Um, and I think a lot of people just really want to find meaning. I think I really see that in Cambridge students, um, that they, even after exam season, it's like, what have I worked so hard for? What have I done all of this for? And then you realise, actually, it all doesn't matter in the end because you die. But being a Christian, it does matter because you, you're doing the work for God and you're doing it for God's glory, even if it's hard, uh, which it is. And I really struggle with medicine, actually. I find it really hard. And um, I think being at Cambridge has taught me so much. It has made, it's humbled me because I've realised there are so many people who are so amazing and um yeah but throughout it all god has shown me so much grace which is basically undeserved kindness and i just hope that everyone can know how compassionate of a god god is um and i hope that in answering my friends questions and i can really bring them that out to them like the beauty of christ the beauty of jesus so that they really want to know him you mentioned like grace and I'm um, thinking like, you know, the lyrics are like amazing grace, you know, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Mm. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Mm. So there, there's clearly that really beautiful contrast of finding things and seeing things that wasn't there for you. And I understand that faith is a, it's a, li- it's a lifelong thing. Like you're always growing in faith and you're, mm learning more about yourself and God throughout that process Mm. so for you um do you have any like major moments when God has really helped you go from lost to found blind to see major moments or or occasions but that you're just like wow (laughs) oh I guess just well we were all not to use i'm trying like trying to avoid i guess christian phrases we were all dead in sin which means we were all separated from god naturally our human condition is to be apart from god because we are just so defiled by sin sin is essentially um things that go against what god wants for us uh, god's good purposes such as lying, stealing, etc., etc., pride. Um, and even after becoming a Christian, you still sin every day. You still hurt God by what you do, and you hurt other people. And I think the worst parts that I felt is when I've hurt other people. So friends, family especially, because I see the worst sides of you. Um, and like areas in which I've messed up but that God still has so much grace for me even in those instances where friends have extended forgiveness um, and each day I'm reminded of the fact that Jesus has redeemed me um, and he offers that to everyone he offers that invitation to everyone and it's up to us to respond and it's a free gift it's a free gift of reconciliation with god despite our awfulness and that is really liberating and it means that whenever we do sin which is all the time in thought indeed in what we do and what we don't do we can still be pure in the eyes of god and his judgment passes over us And um, I guess on that point about, like, sin and just understanding 
the human condition, as you mentioned, and why we struggle, why we feel joy, why we feel the full breadth of human experiences, and why certain things happen to us that it's hard to explain, right? There are things that, good things that you feel really blessed, and also horrible things that you go, why, God, why? Mm. What questions about faith have you had over the years, whether or not you have conquered them? Questions about faith, so... About either God, about how God does things, the nature of God, like, you know, Mm. a common one might be lots of people struggle with the problem of evil, like how does... How? Do, why does an omnipresent, omnipotent, omnibenevolent God allow suffering to happen in this world? Yeah. What puzzles you and what... Yeah. I think so many things puzzle me. Like, that is such a broad question. I have so many questions about Christianity that I really don't understand. Although, there's so many complexities. I know, for one thing... Um, is that I believe in the gospel and that's very simple actually Um, is that you know our sins are taken away by Jesus there's so many things that I will never understand in this life or even you know I feel like even in heaven you'll still have so many questions and you'll still be learning more about God each day Um, and that's the amazing part you know C.S. Lewis describes heaven as as a book and the first page is life on earth and then this book just is never ending and every page gets better and better and sometimes it's hard for my mind to think why would I want heaven like why would you want to live forever um but then Dwayne Lewis describes it as just so amazing and I think about how um the people who I love the most um will die and then I think about how they will be there in heaven. And I think about how God will be there in heaven. And that is just the most wonderful thing. And I think, um, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to it. And it will make everything that is bad in this life worth it. <laughs> um, your YouTube channel, um, you know, you, you've got more than 7,000 subscribers. And, uh, you know, I've watched some of the videos. And in fact, when we were doing... Um, thirsty last week together yeah. when we make sandwiches and uh, you know and then we go outside the club revs Wednesday for student night and hand out sandwiches um I think Lizzie was like oh like I, I watched your video before <laughs> even coming to Cambridge and then she spoke to her brother who's like he knows you and she was like wow you know Rosia um, <laughs> so I guess what I'm trying to say is with a public platform like YouTube Mm. you reach unexpected audience and many people who watches your video you won't know who they are but mm. you've touched them in very unexpected ways and I'm sure you would consider that as God using you to spread the good news and, and other goodness um, why did you start your YouTube channel and um, what was the initial vision of it because the first video is about jamming <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, that it wasn't the first video. Um, I deleted my first videos. Like, obviously, they were even more embarrassing than my videos at the moment. So I'm not going to keep them public. <laughs> but um, I... Yeah, I really liked that jamming video, so I kept it. But my first video was actually like a GCSE study with me, with my brother. Um, that was fun. So I actually started it when I was 16, just for fun. I mean, I've always vlogged like, with my little iPod touch, iPod Nano, I can't remember, no, iPod Nano, um, and what was the question again? Why did you start, what did you want the channel to be initially? Oh, I just started for fun, really, it kind of is still for fun, I think, I'm not very, I'm not taking it very seriously, I probably should, I mean, actually no, I probably shouldn't, I want to, like, it's just really for fun, I think it's, quite cool how there are platforms like this and I think you know I'm just having fun I'm not really thinking about much it sometimes goes really wrong Um, sometimes I get weird comments (laughs) I don't know sometimes my videos are just not that great I mean my videos are basically not that great like I don't spend that much effort editing or um, thinking about them I kind of do them all in one shot but like if it does help someone then I am so privileged to be able to be part of their, you know, part of what helps them. 
even though I feel like I don't really know what I'm doing with it. So your most popular video has 417k views, which is... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how to pass UK driving theory test first time within two hours. Yeah. Which... um. I guess like it, it seems like just a number like oh 417k but even if we conservatively estimate where oh some people might watch it multiple times some mm. people might not watch it there's a good solid group of people they were all in person how do you feel about that level of publicity and scrutiny and has that affected your life on a daily basis <laughs> <laughs> I think Oh, it's quite funny that that's my most watched video because I really didn't expect it. But the thing is, when I'm for driving, yeah, it's a bit weird. But you know, if it helps people, then I'm glad because I was basically it's kind of embarrassing because I haven't even passed my driving test yet, and I did my theory over two years ago. So now I have to redo my theory. So I probably have to watch my own video to redo my theory. (laughs) Um, But I was just confused on what I had to do, and I only had one day to revise. So I texted all my friends for their advice. And then filmed it the day after, after I passed my theory. And the only time where I've thought about it really was when I was in London and this one random guy recognised me from that driving test video. Um, so you were that, just walking on the street and they came up to you and like, oh, you're the driving test. Yeah, basically. <laughs> it was a bit weird. <laughs> but um, apart from that, I don't really think about it. I mean, I'm kind of ha- Most of my subscribers are genuinely probably from that video. So actually, most of my subscribers probably don't even watch my normal videos. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so you've posted some other really cool stuff, like, you know, the O2 NHS, I thought was wonderful, you know, during lockdown, the ode. Um, mm-hmm. You have caught on the kind of YouTube clickbaity things, like 10 things I wish I knew, and that kind of <laughs> stuff. Um, so I guess, do you have an overall marketing strategy? Um, and who do you model kind of your yeah. marketing on? I think that 10 things I wish I knew before boarding school video. I ch- I copied it from one of Unjada Jane's videos. She was, she did 10 things I wish I knew before sixth form and I just copied the thumbnail and the title. <laughs> <laughs> and it did quite well. It shows that you should probably copy people who do well. <laughs> because there's probably a reason why they did. I don't know, I don't really have a strategy. I kind of just go with the flow, you know, just see what I want to do. <laughs> and um, in terms of, like, what you reveal on there, mm. like, obviously, it is a public platform and you don't know who could be seeing it. Some random on the street in London might have watched it. <laughs> but you also obviously want to be authentic and real and, like, where do you see the line between what you're comfortable putting on versus like what is you and who is you because obviously god's in control god made you in his image so there's nothing you necessarily need to be ashamed of and the human condition deems us all as experiencing the same types of struggle albeit obviously differently on circumstances but what do you find comfortable sharing online um Yeah, I used to post more on social media. Now I don't really. I think it's like the more... It's grown... uh, It's the opposite of it's grown on me. I think it's ungrown on me. (laughs) I think I much enjoy living life in the moment and spending time, like quality time with, um, like, people I love. But I think... I guess, like, I have... Like, what you mentioned about shame, I have nothing to be ashamed of because I know that I'm, like, I know because of Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm all good in front of God. But I think that doesn't mean I can't have boundaries and, yeah, be firm in what I decide to share and not share. Even in real life, like, it applies to sharing your time, your friendships, your thoughts with other people. I think it's really important for Christians to know where the lines are, to think about them, because it is a godly thing to do. You'll burn out if you try and share everything and do everything. And God made us finite for a reason. Um, 
to show that we can't be everywhere at once and I think social media kind of makes it seem like we can be everywhere at once like I can be in played on 10 different devices at once like my face kind of like on a YouTube video but anyway more than 10 (laughs) (laughs) yeah but anyway that's not the point I don't know why I said that Um, but the thing is I just find YouTube as something that is fun and I think it's so important as with anything that you do to detach your self-worth from it and to be mindful of how you approach it and I think the bible is the best guide for how we should approach anything in life and I think I don't know where I draw the line I don't really share much of what I do I don't really talk about my deepest feelings on YouTube although I have done before and I deleted those videos but (laughs) uh, (laughs) yeah I think it's a wisdom call okay and um I guess when you look back at your channel so far and all the videos that you know almost almost a hundred videos that you've made and posted do you feel like your um Mm. I guess you do you feel like you've I know this has degrowned on you but have you grown (laughs) with this channel like do you feel like this is almost like a diary kind of of your thoughts like you know you've had like freshest week of how to choose a degree your first moments Mm. like moving to boarding school um reflections on why you're a christian answering questions discussing faith your room tours the vlogs bridgmas carols uh stressful weeks sport uh things you would have done differently like it's a it's a substantial Mm. obviously not whole but it it does reveal personality and it does if uh show reveal character growth and so Mm. what does it mean to you to keep these videos um yeah i think it does mean even though i say like i do it for fun i think even though my videos are that great i think to me they're quite important because i think it's always good to be reminded of how we were in the past to be like to humble ourselves, basically. <laughs> and to realise that we, I'm not as cool as I think I am. Um, but anyway, I think it's really precious to me. And I would encourage anyone to start a channel. Uh, really just, even if you just keep the videos private, to just journal anything, any way of documenting your thoughts, your life. It would be wonderful to look back on, I'm sure as with this podcast for you absolutely absolutely i think it's so i think i think we have this psychological bias that we think we've always thought in the same way um you know examples you know in school mm. is you know older students will always tell younger students like oh you it's six masses now. Like, that doesn't really matter. It's not even that hard. Like it's fine. Look, it's pretty basic algebraic manipulation. Mm. But it's like in that moment and when they were in learning it, it is mm. hard and it is difficult. And some, and it's like when kids miss out on a leadership role, mm. obviously we can see that their life is not defined by it, and they can still live a healthy, productive, good life. But mm. I think if you have these reminders that we also once felt the same things and we also once stressed about our futures and worried mm. about where things are it does humble you so I, I really much resonate with what you say and I, mm. I definitely find with the podcast as well where gosh I, I listen back and I go oh why did I even ask that or couldn't I have framed it much better and mm. but I think that's also the beauty of it is accepting that we are imperfect but this imperfection is what makes life um, quite beautiful you kept on saying that um your videos aren't great which I'm not I don't want to like get into <laughs> arguing oh actually it's great it's not but I think the the views the subscribers and everything says it all but obviously it's you being humble but what does it actually like walk me through the behind the scenes of creating a video because i'm thinking you may have ideas mm. generation you mm. might need to film a bit of editing uh posting reviewing like how does the whole process work especially for people who may want to be as cool as <laughs> oh 
Oh no. <laughs> I, I mean, I can show you my process on my phone. I mean, like, podcast listeners probably won't be able to see. But, you know, oh, so I'll describe it. feel very it. privileged. So, okay. for example... <laughs> Is that iMovie? Yeah, I edit on my phone and I just put together clips and I just do this. So, this is a vlog. So, you can put it, like, through camera roll, you just upload it? Yeah, yeah, from my camera roll. And then sometimes I do voiceovers, sometimes I speak. So, for example, I can be like, I can just do a video now. Hello, I am doing an interview right now. Mid-interview as well. (laughs) (laughs) And I can film a YouTube video later and put this clip into the YouTube video. And you'll be able to see it in the YouTube video. And I don't really edit it much. I just kind of like, just like talk. <laughs> but yeah, that's that 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 is the process. <laughs> Hope you enjoy listening to um, Rosie's episode. <laughs> yeah, listen to the podcast. It's happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> we were creating history. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Alright, so it's actually not that complicated then. No. It's just quite spontaneous and just in the flow, whatever you feel like. Yeah, basically. I think I don't really have time to, to, to make it make it good, but I think it's nice that it's kind of spontaneous because it shows that you know I'm I'm literally just a student. I don't really have fancy camera or anything, as fancy, fancy cameras. I do. I have one fancy camera, but I don't really use it that much. Um, yeah. There was a comment that I really liked. Um, <laughs> I hope you don't mind me reading it out. Uh, People often say that England is a depressing country. They never met Rosie Lee. If you're a... <laughs> if you're like this in England, I'm just wondering if you're going in another country where people are a lot happier, like Finland, it would be interesting to see life emoji. You 100% must be a doctor. Your smile and positive energy already saves lives. So a very warm, positive... <laughs> comment but also quite quite i I, i'm out of adjectives so but how does this kind of stuff makes you feel and you you commented you're too kind (laughs) when you get a comment like that Uh, what what emotions does it trigger you know people often say that england is a depressing country they never met rosie early i mean it's kind of cringy isn't it like it's a bit awkward it's a bit weird. <laughs> I mean, like, it is very kind of that person, but it's just not true, isn't it? And also, like, it's a bit weird. So I get a bit awkward when I get comments like that. But, you know, people are sometimes strange. I'm a bit strange, so I'll just accept it and move on. <laughs> Most memorable comments? Most memorable? What do you remember when you think about your YouTube comments? Mm, I think... I I really like comments where... It's people just appreciating. Like, I really like comments when it's just, like, younger students um, talking about what they're doing and me being reminded of what I was like back then. And do you have any aspirations for the YouTube channel in the short term, medium term or long term? Or is it just see what happens? Um, I definitely like to carry on vlogging. So, long term, yes, I want to carry on vlogging and I want to keep it as a sort of personal diary. I have no aspirations for it. It is just a personal journal and it's very, like, it's fun when other people watch it. I think my mum is my biggest supporter and, like, it's just great. Has she featured much? Uh, not really. She doesn't like to be on my YouTube channel, and she always, like, gets angry at me whenever I put her on. (laughs) I mean, not angry, but she's like, why are you... Anyway, yeah. Do you speak Mandarin at home? I do. I speak Zhongwen to my mum and my dad, and my brother. Did you go to Chinese school? I did. I've been to Chinese school all my life since I was young, but then I stopped going when I was, like, 12. Okay. And you enjoy Chinese school? Not particularly. It was a bit boring. (laughs) But, you know, I'm grateful that I got to learn a bit so I can write and read a tiny bit. But my Chinese isn't great. And that's something that I'd really love to improve on in the future. Mm. So with boarding school, I always find 
people who go to boarding school are incredibly courageous. Like, for me, like, teenage years, like, I felt like I loved just having the comfort of home where I could mm. do a whole day of school and maybe activities and just go back home and feel that familiarity mm. and, you know, have deliciously made Chinese food, which mm. is it, just it's wonderful. And I, mm. I can't imagine... Uh, I, for for me personally, just being away from home for an extended period of time, why did you decide to go to boarding school, and was that your decision or your like parents' uh, encouragement, or did it just come by chance, like you know Hogwarts where you know, the the letter <laughs> arrived and there's nothing you oh, could no. do to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was actually summoned by like a mysterious <laughs> owl. Um, it was a bit weird, but. You know, I went there when I was... <laughs> I, no, my, I just wanted to go because my piano teacher suggested it. And I was like, why not? And I've always loved trying new things. Um, it was... Fantastic. So you went for music? Yeah. I went there for music, mostly. Because, yeah, it was just like, it had a great music school. Um, lots of pianos to play. Yeah. So awesome. one's not enough, you need multiple. <laughs> yeah, there were so many pianos, oh my gosh. Like 20-something pianos. In the school? Yeah. Wow. Maybe even 30. Wow. Yeah. And just in different rooms and you can access it whenever... Are they different types yeah. of pianos or...? Um, they were a lot of uprights and a lot of grands as well. Okay. There were probably about five grands. Wow. Six grands. Yeah. Wow. Just flexing my school's pianos. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> so you sounded like you were pretty good at piano. Did you like do grades or diploma? Like what was your Um Yeah, I mean like any other Chinese kid, you know, I did grades. <laughs> so um, Yeah, I've always loved piano. I think I don't know, sometimes I feel like I lack passion for anything. Like even though I play the piano and I spent so much time time on it, like I just I just feel like I'm not passionate about it. Um, apart from like God, I feel like the only thing I'm passionate. About. Anyway, anyway, yeah, I love playing the piano and um, it taught me a lot. For example, memorizing in medicine, you've got to memorize loads of things, and I had to memorize a really long piece at one point, and I thought. I couldn't memorise it, but then I saw this quote which is like, memorising music is just like playing it again and again and again until it becomes a part of you. And I just think... It's repetition. Yeah, repetition and playing it without the music. And I think it taught me a lot of perseverance and, yeah. How many songs could you play without looking at music? I don't know. I don't know. Not many now. I haven't played the piano in a while. What was the highest level you got? And any cool memories associated with piano, like any performances? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was telling David about how um, I really enjoyed... One of my favourite memories from school was playing um, a piano concerto with a school orchestra. And that was a highlight because of what it taught me about memorising and perseverance. Because, like, after all, like, dedicating time to something is what you need to do in order to do well at something and it just taught me that you know hard work is important mm -hmm. um, I yeah I can resonate I did a lot of piano as well as a kid and I just think the act of just sitting down there for an hour and, and just playing especially on the days when you don't feel like it has mm. really helped to shape me where not every like the whole journey might be good but it doesn't mean that every day, every moment, you're going to feel great. Yeah. Um, but also, I think just having, like, a teacher who who knows you and who tracks your progress and who encourages you, I felt like it was really helpful as a kid to have someone like that who I yeah. can trust, um, much like basketball coaching as well for me. Um, mm. But the one thing I did find with piano, and I'll be keen to hear what you uh, found with your own musical pursuits, that I found with piano... It was it was wonderful because it, it obviously the music were complicated they were beautiful you know anything could be played on a piano but in order for it to be a more social experience 
you need to be like the best because like in bands and orchestras there's only really one piano player yeah. and there's always um, unfortunately um, someone who was better than me and there's always just someone better in them. Maybe not in your case, I'm sure you might have been that kid, but for most people, they're not that kid. So then I got to end of primary school and just like, oh, you know, I'm pretty decent level, but I don't think I'm ever going to be like the best. And then I switched to trombone and euphonium because they're rare. Um, and even though I hadn't played them as much or played them as well, I could then easily be a part of social groups. So for you on your musical journey, did you find piano as satisfying enough as a solo thing or did you also uh, try other instruments so that you could be a part of ensembles and groups and go on tours and perform and yeah? Um, yeah, I definitely wasn't that kid. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not like, I feel like I also really struggled with the piano and there was a moment when I was really young that I can still really vividly remember. I just, like, started playing the piano. And then my I didn't want to practice, and I kept on crying and, like, being annoying at my parents. And then my mum just, like, slammed my books down and was like, "You, if you're learning piano, if I'm paying for your piano lessons, then you've got to practice. <laughs> so, <laughs> How old were so you? Like, I don't know, probably six. Okay. Um, so then I practised. Um, and <laughs> I think... So lots of tears. <laughs> no. I'm yeah, yeah, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good lesson. I'm really grateful for my parents for giving me the opportunity to learn instruments. Um, so yeah, I I did. I like. I guess one reason why I played the viola is that it is an easier instrument to get into orchestras with, and that's given me lots of memories too. And I really enjoy playing the viola at church and um, being involved with that now. Um, yeah. Um, did you take grades for viola too? I did. I did. And can you make a video on how to get to grade 8 within two hours of practice? <laughs> <laughs> oh, probably more like how to get to grade 8 with a million hours of practice. <laughs> um, yeah. So have you been doing much um, music at uni or has um, other things got in the way and if so would you consider taking up music again as you're a little older i don't know i've i thought about this before and i'm like do i actually enjoy music <laughs> and i think i do <laughs> i i joined trinity hall chapel choir in my first term at uni and that was fun but i don't know whether it's the thing that i enjoy the most like i feel like with something like badminton I'm always really happy when I play it and I always have the best time and it really does give me such a good break from work. Um, but I'm not sure if I feel the same way with music. I mean, nothing can beat the feeling of being in an orchestra and playing an amazing piece and sitting in the viola section. But also, I don't know whether I'll pick it up even next year when I have more time. Um, yeah. So badminton, you play on the uni team, the blues team at Cambridge. Uh, what's the regime or what's the training? Like, is it very intense? Do you have to wake up at 6am and do all these uh, runs? And what, what does it entail? Um, I think personally, you can make it as intense or as chill as you want to. Wait, that doesn't make sense. I think generally, you can make it <laughs> as intense or as chill as you want to. Personally, I think I make it quite chill. I think, I mean, in first term, I got a prize for being, I think I got two prizes. One was being most absent at training. And the second <laughs> one was um, the biggest try hard. As in, it was ironic because I didn't try, which isn't great. Like, you should probably try if you're in a sport. Um, yeah, that's an attitude that I would like to fix for next year. But I think... You can choose as many sessions as you'd like to. There's opportunities to play four or five times a week, but you also don't have to go at all in one week. So that's what I love about it. Also, it's very chill. Have you always played badminton? Um, yeah, basically. I started training properly when I was eight. Wow. Yeah. And what level did you reach? Like nationals or... 
the like, county? Um, well, I stopped playing badminton competitively when I was 13. Okay. So I guess the highest levels that I've played at um, were like very junior levels. Like I never got into, say, like when you're an older teen, yep. that kind of level. Um, mm. But yeah, I played a lot of tournaments and it was quite stressful. And I think that was one of like the most stressful times of my life was playing stressful to win or to perform at the standard that you know that you're capable of i think i don't know what it was it was a bit i think it was stressful for me because i found it socially stressful (laughs) genuinely (laughs) (laughs) i think it was like off the court socializing yeah yeah (laughs) i just really didn't like it (laughs) Um, so that's why i found it stressful (laughs) (laughs) Mm. Mm. Um, but now at uni it's better yeah yeah everyone's so lovely at uni (laughs) i'm so excited for next year's season we're definitely going to beat oxford (laughs) (laughs) which reminded me earlier on in the interview you said back in like year seven you used to have these arguments about all sorts of things uh were you just uh (laughs) a very staunch advocate for what you believed and oh, no. were you getting very over the top like what what does year seven passionate Rosia looked like and what does she sound like and do you still agree with her on most of those arguments i mean i was definitely a bit arrogant i mean i kind of still am sometimes but anyway <laughs> um i just don't really know i think i was just very passionate about defending <laughs> God, even though he need, he doesn't need me to defend him. I mean, his word can defend itself. Um, and I think sometimes you've just got to let go because you can't change people's minds. It's God that makes people Christians and it's God's miraculous work in other people's hearts. It's a heart change, right? Um, actually, today in college prayer, Max, who's um, part of our college group, was sharing how there's a verse in Matthew which is like, ask and you will receive, um, seek and you will find, um, part of the Sermon on the Mount. And we often think of that as in like asking God for something physical or something that is your deepest desire and he'll grant it to you. But actually, like, he doesn't promise Christians anything. He only promises us Jesus and that is the most wonderful promise ever. But actually we should ask God for a heart change um, and that is so good that we can ask him for that and he does that work in us i don't know where i was going with that where was i going with that oh i was i guess like (laughs) yeah year seven me was just a bit cringe like i was always a bit cringe whoa be real just went off wait no it didn't someone posted late wait no it did go off do you want to take it yeah i need to podcast With your fits, Billy, so. <laughs> yeah. The silence is just oh, the no. be real. Uh. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I've just recently re downloaded it and I'm kind of like, I'm trying to post. But anyway, it's not a big deal. I'm sorry, I just kind of ruined it. Carry on. It came at the perfect time when we were talking about year seven you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, is your brother older than you? Uh, no, he's a year and a half younger than me. <laughs> okay, and I guess that's a good age gap where you get to play around and be on pretty equal... No, you'll be far more mature, but... <laughs> But what was the what what was he like and what was um the dynamics like between you two? Like did you fight over the Xbox and PlayStation? <laughs> did you roll around in the mud or, or, or were you that protective, kind, warm big sister who guided him? <laughs> you, <laughs> you look a bit embarrassed. I wasn't a protective, kind, warm big sister. I'm kind of <laughs> rude and I'm kind of mean to him. But it's okay. He needs that character development. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I always punched him or hit him. What? It was like, it was kind of mean of me. But like, but like soft he punches. also punched me, so. Soft ones. No, like proper punches. Proper punches? Not like proper, proper. Like, I'm actually really weak, but. Um, I just. Like, I'm, 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 tr- I'm not actually that violent now. 
Like, I do restrain oh, myself. He's seven, Rosie. It was scary. I know, but, like, he bit me once, so it's okay. And, like, yeah. Anyway, I'm just, like, divulging my... <sighs> but, anyway, we fought a lot. <laughs> so, I wasn't that caring. But, you know, we never really learn. And I'm not that mature now. <laughs> but, yeah. At least I don't physically fight my brother because he would beat me up. How would you feel about um, complimenting him? Like, if you were to think about all the good qualities about him? Or is that a bit, like, uncomfortable to say? Um, like, would you be comfortable saying, like, I love him in his face? Probably not. <laughs> no, no, I do, tell you, I do tell him I love him. But in a more playful way. Mm. Yeah. Because I think in Asian families, sometimes, like, it's easier to say, I love you to mum, but, like, saying it to dad, especially as a son, is, like... I mean, I do say it to my dad. Mm. I guess it might be different if you're a son. Um, But, yeah, I'm fine with saying I love you. It is always a bit awkward with the brother. (laughs) (laughs) Because you just feel like showing love is like punching them, you know? (laughs) But... I'm I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to change. I mean, I'm an adult now, so I can interact with my brother in a normal way. May At least I, I'm trying to. May I suggest you ask for a change of heart? Yes, I do. <laughs> I need a change of heart. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah. So is it overall quite an, would you say your family is quite like expressive? Or is it more like it is so, the bond is so strong that you don't need to necessarily express everything? Um, like, how yeah. open are you to talk about, like, like big life decisions and struggles? Like, is it very, very open atmosphere in the family? Or is it more like you can just kind of read the situation and just love regardless? I'm very open with my mum. I have, I really like calling my mum every day mm. and talking to her. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's just different, though, for everyone. It depends on what you're comfortable sharing with your parents. Mm. Um, but I really like having her as someone who can, like, help me with anything that I'm unsure about, life issues, can pray for me. Um, yeah, so... Do you want to say some, in the context of, I guess, giving you a legacy worthy interview um, to capture in the recording, do you want to say some nice things about your family and what you appreciate <laughs> about them seeing you're quite open and expressive <laughs> oh no <laughs> I anyway Benjamin if you are listening to this that's my brother by the way oh by the way also yeah could you divvy up the thanks in both English and Chinese so we capture both of your language skills <laughs> <laughs> how you divvy it up will be up to no, you no <laughs> I'm so bad at Chinese <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to go for English. Actually, I might go for Chinese for my parents. Benjamin, I'm sorry for punching you all the time. I hope you forgive me, and I'll try to be a better sister in the future. And you're really great, and you've become really independent in the past year. And, um, yeah, trying new experiences, and I admire that quality about you because I feel like I enjoy being at home. Well, that's also not a bad thing, but it just means that we're different. Anyway... Um, mum and dad, um, Chinese, Chinese, <laughs> ah, um, 我非常爱你们，谢谢你给我很多机会可以学习，然后你们也嗯教教教过我很多东西，然后。最最重要的就是你你们受给我耶稣的爱然后你们每天为我祷告然后我非常感谢你们因为 yeah, I can't thank you guys enough I feel like I'm, yeah I don't know why that felt like a prayer I was about to say in Jesus' name, Amen <laughs> But no, it wasn't a prayer Oh gosh that's beautiful and obviously our parents and you know our family and our community have had a you know have sacrificed so much for us that we can't really repay it 
we can really try our best and pay it forward and mm. you know trust that God will work mm. his way of rewarding people justly mm. as a perfect judge um so in terms of your church community as you mentioned before where being a Christian means you've got family everywhere mm-hmm. were you at the same home church um or, or how many different churches have you been a part of and mm. how similar or different are those different church communities um yeah i went to a chinese church growing up so so everything was done in chinese yeah but they had um english bible studies i mean i I was in english sunday schools for the kids because the parents would all you know have services in chinese but the kids first languages were all english so we had sunday school in english and we had (laughs) Um, then when we were a bit older, we we joined an English, English speaking service at the church. Um, so what was my experience like there, and how does that compare to Cambridge? Yeah, well, assuming these are the two churches that you've been involved in. Yeah. So yeah, I've only really been involved in Eden Baptist Church and Milton Keynes Chinese Christian Church at home. They are pretty different. Um, yeah like lots of things are different the fact that it's a chinese church is already just very different because everyone's asian um i think that's also i guess the beauty of being a christian is that churches are all just so different but like as long as everything centers on the bible we all like believe and trust in the same jesus and that's what unites everyone um yeah so do you think that the the obviously two churches can be centered on the same bible but you know different teaching can deviate a little bit have you personally noticed any deviations in teachings um in teachings yeah like interpretations of certain scriptures text messages Mm. like the baptist church for example might go well a baptism must be for immersion yeah i think there are differences um like but I don't think any of the differences that I've encountered are big issues. And I think, um, like some things, but the Bible is very clear on, like issues of sin, um, which determines salvation because Jesus died for sin. Um, and he, yeah, he, um, that is, you know, determines whether or not a church is a Christian church. But other things such as baptism, um, I don't know, other secondary issues um, are just like, I guess, a matter of opinion. And we'll never know until we see Jesus face to face, I guess. Um, Any other things you want to say about the church communities that have really shaped you? Mm. I think looking back, it's just amazing to see how much, how important prayer is just thinking like so many people must have prayed for me and for like at church and growing together with people um encouraging each other even just yesterday I went to it's not church Christian Union isn't a church but um I went to a reps training which is a training for people who lead college groups and we were praying for new freshers and I just thought wow like when I was a fresher the reps above me prayed for me too and it's just amazing how like prayer is just so central and we can plead with for each other to god and he works through that um, because he gladly chooses to and yeah we were made for community so i'm very grateful of it wonderful that's beautiful um, in the context of giving you a legacy worthy interview, you know, a piece of recording that you can look back on in 30, 40 years time, mm. is there anything else that you want to be included in here or else I've got a few just to wrap up? Mm. We've touched on quite a bit. so. Yeah. Well, I would say if you haven't become bored of my voice already, um, one thing that I would encourage you um, is to investigate who Jesus is if you're not yet a Christian and to see the wonderful things he has on offer for you to see how wonderful he is and that is something that you won't regret 
and if you are a Christian, keep going. You know, you've got this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a round of rapid fire questions. So mm-hmm. just your instant response. Yeah. Um, what's your favourite breakfast? Um, I don't know, Chinese breakfast, like a nice warm soup with like, what's it called, your tiao. Oh, wow, that's delicious. But I also love any breakfast, like I love breakfast so much. I could like, I could talk for an hour about breakfast. Do you make your tiao at home? Well, my mum does. Wow, that's so good. Yeah. Um, how would you describe your style in one word or multiple if you need Probably chaotic. <laughs> um, what were you afraid of as a child? Um, clocks. Also, I want to change the word for style. I don't think my style is that chaotic. I just think it's quite monotonous because I always wear the same clothes. Uh, what's one of the nicknames you've received from friends? Roro. Do you like it? No. What's the nickname that you actually like? I don't really have a nickname that I like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, is your bed made right now? Is it like, are you an organised person? Ah, uh, normally it is made, but today it isn't. <laughs> so I'd say on the organised to unorganised scale, I'm like middle. What dish do you cook best? Shepherd's pie. Favourite board game? Um, don't have one. <laughs> Finish the sentence. The way to my heart is... Um... <laughs> God? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have pets? No. Dogs or cats? No. No, I said dogs or cats. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, dogs. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. A or B, no. <laughs> C. <laughs> um... What's like the most like adventurous thing you've you've done? I oh, I don't even know. Um genuinely probably like being a Christian. It's just like so cool. Second to last question then. Um obviously as a Christian, you know, the, the, the treasure, the, the real treasure, the, what was most important is in heaven, you know, spending time with God and living a perfect life with God. Um, so in that sense, you know, what is truly important is there, but as part of this first page of your book, as, you know, quoting C.S. Lewis, as you mentioned, it's this life and Obviously, we don't know when we head on and flip the page, but in your ideal sense, like, is there anything that you really want to be written on this page that before it gets flipped over? Like some people might mention, for example, that they want to visit at least like all the different continents. Some people might say they really want a kid. Other people might say they really want to leave a legacy in a particular way by winning a prize or playing... Like, is there anything for you that Mm. has to be, that not has to be, but you really, really hope when your page gets flipped, it'll be on it? Um, I think, I mean, I definitely don't think I'm anywhere close to, to it or that I think that it would describe me, but I think what would... Like, as in what would I most like to be remembered for, I think is, is that the question? Well, like, was there anything that you feel like you need to do or achieve in this life? Or, or to be remembered oh, for? Oh, okay. Yeah. 
Um, I think if I were to die next week, for example, it would be the most wonderful thing to be remembered as someone who loved Jesus and to that would be all I would want and that would make me so happy in heaven um, yeah nothing else really compares but say if you were gonna live till 90 mm. is there things in the material sense that you want to in the earthly sense that you want to have mm. done um, like if I have a family I want to be I want to have loved my family well um, and that I think is the most important thing to me and what does love mean to you? Um, I think love is just like can't really describe it it's just like loving well, it is patient and kind it does not envy and boast it's not arrogant or rude mm. it does not insist on its own way it is not irritable or resentful it does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth you agree mm. with that definition oh yeah i mean it's god's definition nothing could be more perfect than that <laughs> <laughs> and also i guess uh p.s is god can uh love can also be a massive punch <laughs> why because you and your brother that's oh. the way I'm showing that. <laughs> oh no no that's not good love don't copy me <laughs> um, I feel you're like why like in a very curious sense <laughs> <laughs> alright um, last question typical final one what's one message quote or saying you wish like every educator teacher community leader church leader like please just don't say like oh just no you've already said that like in your own <laughs> words okay. and every child would internalize like when you think about your journey you know um you know uh when you kind of grew up at uh well, when you were born in colchester uh buckinghamshire you know your local ch- uh, chinese church doing the bible studies the sunday schools doing mm-hmm. the piano practices going through moments of doubt of not knowing whether you actually enjoy piano that you know anecdote of you crying as a six-year-old like not wanting to practice but then realizing the sacrifice that your family has made um you know your school achievers that year seven angry um but <laughs> A, a angry Razia, but um, who's standing up for God and defending God, and 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 in your own words, I guess you you were a little arrogant, but I think it's nice to reflect back and realize the progresses that we've made, and there's definitely nothing wrong as a kid to be assertive, and you know if any children's listening, um, definitely do not be put off by what you believe in, um, and also I guess you know you with viola, piano, doing the concerto playing badminton competitively, struggling perhaps a bit with socially, but then now finding your group again, uh, starting your YouTube channel, uh, of the, was it the first video, GCSE, a study of you and your brother, mm-hmm. um, jamming, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, 10 things you would do differently, um, filming all the different things, editing videos, getting some awkward comments, getting recognised in London, um, here at Cambridge, you know, being involved in the Christian Union, finding your group, praising God, all those sessions, all those prayers that you've asked for and all those prayers that have been answered. When you tie all of that kind of together, what would you really want children to internalise and know your life philosophy? Oh my gosh, that's a big question. I think, <laughs> like, oh, I have to think about this for a second. I think it's not that serious. <laughs> That's a very not Christian message. It's not that deep. Yeah, <laughs> that, that is what I want to say. It's not that deep. Take everything serious. Don't take yourself seriously. Don't take anything seriously apart from God. That is my message. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. And yeah, I, I hope you found value this experience. And I hope that you know, one day will be meaningful. And, mm. yeah. Thank you. I really enjoyed yeah, it. Thank you, David. Thank you for your time and for the Fitzbillies cake. It was really good. <laughs> <laughs>